Uh, to kick it off, I want to, uh, uh, we have two people. Uh, I'll introduce our chief and then our chief will introduce our mayor, but she'll make a, a quick comment. We, that what we've done and what many of you have heard about and been calling us about, uh, we've been able to do because of great leadership. And I truly don't say that because I report to the chief and we report to the mayor that it really has, you know, the chief and the mayor have had this vision about how they wanted the police department to operate in terms of transparency, rebuilding public trust, and letting us go. And at no point along the way, and we'll tell the Seattle story uh, during the first part of the agenda, but at no point along the way, and, we, and you'll hear, we, we tried some pretty crazy things, case in point, hiring a, a hacker who's sitting at the table here across from the chief, that at no point in time did the chief or the mayor ever question us. I mean, that, that is true leadership. That is really helping, supporting uh, everyone who's been working on this from Seattle. And, and I think that, that we're emerging as sort of a national leader in this issue. So I want to put that out there that we're not, you know, we just don't have the chief here and, and Mayor Murray to deliver the obligatory welcoming comments. Mm -hmm. It is really the leadership that they provided uh, to us that has allowed us to get to where we are today. So with that, I'd like to introduce my boss, Chief O'Toole. Thanks very much, Mike. I really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to start by welcoming you all to Seattle. I'm a relative newcomer myself. Today I celebrate my first anniversary on the job here as police chief, um, and it's been an incredible year. I, I come from Boston originally, and uh, I've really enjoyed this experience in the Pacific Northwest. For those of you from out of town, don't believe all the stories about the dire weather. It's been beautiful like this since I arrived. So. Um, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for coming and joining us in this conversation, this very important conversation. Uh, we uh, appreciate the, the co-sponsorship of the White House Police Data Initiative, the Police Foundation, uh, Code for America. This is truly a team effort. We're just pleased that we're able to host this particular uh, dialogue. Uh, Again, everybody knows that the Seattle Police Department's been under a federal consent decree for the past few years, and I think it was a very difficult time for the organization, but boy, we definitely see the light at the end of the tunnel now. I've been in the, this business for a long time, and I've discovered over many years that the departments that are easiest to change are the ones facing the biggest challenges. There's a real sense of urgency. Uh, people are really committed to reform here. And uh, even the rank and file, I think we, we have more than a critical mass of police officers now who are really excited about the change. Uh, when I came through the door, I knew it would be a difficult time for policing uh, here in Seattle. Never imagined we'd face all the challenges we're facing on a national level now. Uh, but I really think that it, you know, it's exciting to, to be in the business now because with every crisis comes an opportunity. And uh, I really think that uh, body cams are huge, uh, can be a huge tool for us as we uh, continue our dialogue going forward and as we work to enhance community trust. Uh, when I took this job, as I said, I knew it would be a challenge, but uh, I also knew I was confident that I had a, a boss who would back me every step of the way, and boy, over the past year, that has certainly been the case. Uh, Mayor Murray has absolutely uh, been there to, to back not only me, but our police officers during these difficult times. And uh, I really appreciate the, the genuine support that he's shown to us. He made it very clear to me that he wants the Seattle Police Department to be second to none. And when it comes to technologies, he wants us to be at the leading edge. Uh, so again, I knew I had to surround myself with a great team. So I uh, brought in Mike Wagers, Greg Russell. You know, we now have Tim Clemens on board. Tim uh, won definitely won me over when he delivered that uh, original glazed donut to my desk. And uh, so thanks, Tim. But uh, you know, again, it, I think Mike hit the, the nail on the head that it's all about leadership. And in this city, it's all about Mayor Murray's leadership. So thank you, Mayor, for your support. And thank you for coming here to kick off this, uh, this discussion today. Thank you, Chief. And uh, let me welcome all of you to Seattle. And those of you who are from Seattle, welcome to this very, very important discussion. You know, just a year and a half ago, I became the mayor of Seattle, and we had a consent decree, and I made a commitment at that time uh, with the Seattle Police Force that we would not just fulfill the requirements of the consent decree, but we would make Seattle's police force the model for urban policing in America. And under Chief O'Toole's leadership <clears throat> for the last year, and by the way, you are no longer a newcomer in Seattle. If you've been here a year, you are a native. Um, 
This is a city where people constantly are arriving, and I, I may be the only native that you, real native that you'll meet. Um, but on, on a serious note, the work that we have to do and the recognition that we were we are already getting, even though we are still under the consent decree, is pretty amazing. And it's because of the officers of this department and because of the leadership of Chief O'Toole. And along those lines, what we are doing in regards to body camera also is one of the leading things that I think that Seattle can learn how to do and lead the rest of the nation on. I think our approach has been um, thoughtful. Uh, there is a, you know, given, given the crisis that we're going through in America right now and the difficult times that the city is having, like most cities, doing this right is as, just as important as just doing it. And we could have just done it. Uh, but instead, we were methodical about putting together a pilot project that the chief and Mike Wagers uh, now have, have underway, identify the issues uh, that we need to learn from so that we can take this to scale, uh, get the balance between transparency and privacy right. And obviously, uh, bringing on one of the tech people who were challenging us was uh, uh, just a, a move of brilliance, um, I hope. No, it is. And, um, and, and and also really uh, uh, looking at how we how we I mean the technical stuff is really here, very complicated and for those of you who aren't from Washington State we have very very broad public disclosure laws I mean incredibly broad uh, and so the idea of how we find that balance is probably more difficult here than almost anywhere else uh, in America but I believe with the creativity and leadership of our chief Mike Wagers in this department. Uh, we are going to learn how to do this and do it right. And ultimately what we want to do, ultimately what this is about, is about once again making people feel safe and making people feel good about the police department and also making the police feel like they are once again part of the community and that they are also safe. And so both these, these goals, both these values, I think have, have the same outcome. And, and this discussion today will help us get there. I look forward to hearing the results. And again, enjoy our weather. This is June um, in Seattle, and usually we don't see weather like this till August. So uh, and you must have all brought it with you. Thanks very much. So let me set, <clears throat> let me set the stage for today. Uh, and then we'll get into the first part of the agenda and sort of telling the Seattle story. Uh, <clears throat> policing's in a crisis. Yeah. And those aren't just my words. You know, those are, you hear that from now more and more chiefs across the country saying it. That policing's in a crisis. You hear Commissioner Bratton in New York, Commissioner Ramsey in Philadelphia saying that almost on a daily basis. And there's no doubt in my mind that uh, we are at a point in time uh, where we are witnessing and will continue to witness uh, a profound transformation in this profession. And many of you have been involved in this profession, like Chief O'Toole, much longer than I am. But I think we're at a significant point in time where things are changing and changing for the better. Certainly, race and how we engage uh, and interact uh, with minority communities, especially African American, the African American community is at, is at the heart of this, can't be denied. The question is, why now? Why are these critical questions being asked of us at, at this point in time? Have we all of a sudden started using more lethal force? You know, we don't have good data on it. I know our friends at the Police Foundation and, and others are gathering that information, but the answer is still probably not. I think we're going to see a decline in the use of lethal force across the country. The why now is video. Video has brought to light some of the problems we are facing in this business. It has brought to light questions about our training, our policies and procedures, uh, our crime strategies, uh, and our street level tactics. But don't get me wrong, not, not blaming video, right? not saying it's the cause of our problems, uh, and I'm not saying that everything we do as a profession uh, is wrong. We know that that's not true. It has simply raised a level of awareness about some of the problems that the field faces. But video is not new. It's not like it was invented yesterday. But what is new is smartphone. Right? I don't write anything down. I use a smartphone for everything. What is new is the smartphone. <clears throat> In 2010, so it was five years ago, 20% of the US population owned a smartphone. 
By the end of this year, leading into next year, two-thirds of the U.S. population uh, will own one. That's a, that is a three-fold increase in five or six years. So nearly everyone has a smartphone, which means everyone has a very user-friendly way to record everything. And we record everything. I mean, those of us sitting around the table, if we record selfies of ourselves, and we post it immediately uh, to the Internet, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera. So policing's in a crisis, and video has been a part of spurring that crisis. Our contention is certainly video can be a part of the solution as well. Enter body-worn cameras. We know from the research <clears throat> that when officers wear body-worn cameras, uh, something changes. Right? Whether that is officer behavior, that's citizen behavior, or some combination of both, something changes. And the empirical data is piling up, showing that body cams reduce use of force incidents, showing us that body cams reduce citizen complaints among two of the more positive outcomes. And we all like to quote the Rialto study because it was an experimental design, but there are more out there, and there are more coming thanks to funded research by the Department of Justice and NIJ, and maybe Jim can speak to it later. We know that there are studies coming out this summer that are going to continue to show the positive impact uh, that body cameras have on police-citizen interactions. So let me stop here and, and, and be clear. And we can go ahead and take this one off the table. And that was part of the, the agenda and discussion that when we were developing the agenda with some of our colleagues in other police departments that we we're going to do some myth-busting and take some of the red herrings away and so we could really dive in and have a great conversation about the real substantive issues. Body cameras are not a panacea. No one's saying they're a panacea. If you already have a huge chasm between your police department and your community, especially your minority community, putting body cameras, as we many of you said before, in Dallas, Orlando, elsewhere in the media, that, that's not going to change that. That's not going to bridge that chasm unless you're doing a lot of other things differently as well. So where are we as a field on body cameras? Uh, well, one, the train has left the station. Well, I was at the IECP before Chief O'Toole brought me in uh, last year. And we were talking about body cameras spreading across the law enforcement field long before Ferguson. We were these are folks that have been working in the law enforcement technology field for a long time, discussing and seeing, looking at the lay of the land, that this technology is spreading faster than anything else they've seen in the law enforcement uh, field. Our friends from Taser are here, and I uh, don't know if V-View is here yet. I'm sure they could probably quote the stats on the, uh, uh, the adoption and penetration of body cameras for law enforcement, like I quoted the stats about the adoption and penetration of smartphones. Certainly we have a lot of questions to answer, but they're not insurmountable, as the chief and the mayor said. It will take some creativity to think through the issues. It will take some thoughtfulness to, to figure uh, some of this out. For example, one of the questions, uh, when to record and when not to record. That's, that's almost the first question that we get asked when we get calls from other departments or from the media. <clears throat> to me, I, I think that Technology is also going to help solve part of that problem. Good policy, good training. Certainly we need to lay that out. We've done that, and you'll hear during our discussion about the Seattle uh, body camera experience. But I think we're going to see technology help us solve part of that problem with auto activation, which I know is out there now. It's also going to help us with longer battery life and the storage issues. So some of the questions I think uh, will be actually answered today, and that's when we have invited a lot of our technology friends who you'll see sitting around the table and we invite them to jump in during the discussion. So it's not just a discussion with, among police departments, it's also a discussion among folks we have here who are privacy experts, who really think about transparency, but we want those who really understand technology and know where the technology is heading, headed to jump into discussion as well to help inform our thinking. Among the many questions and in, in why we're here today, is what do we do with all the video? I'm less worried about the hardware. I think Taser, Vview, 
others, they're gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna get better, smaller, the field of view, all that's gonna continue to improve just like our smartphones improve. That technology is gonna get better. Storage options continue to see the price decline, just like in the consumer world when you think about cloud storage. The question I think that, that nags at us, it doesn't just nag at us because of the uniqueness of Washington state law and our public disclosure law, is what do you do with all the video? There's gonna be this public expectation that we're doing something with it, that we're just not collecting uh, uh, the video. So it's really how do, you, how, do you, how do you use it? And the chief made it clear when she came in, she laid out four priorities. And so that's helped guide our thinking, not just what we're doing here, but it's guided our thinking in everything we've been doing over the past year. Is her first priority coming in and providing direction to the department is that we're gonna enhance public trust. We're gonna rebuild and enhance public trust between the Seattle Police Department and the community that we serve. So a lot of the things, that, well, everything that we've been doing around the body camera pilot project, posting it online, et cetera, has been around that belief that if we can increase transparency in a lot of different ways, but certainly with this video data, if we can increase transparency, that will help us increase public trust as well. But that, as I mentioned, is the purpose of the day. Talk about how do you use public, uh, how do you use police videos? How do you provide public access to promote transparency and accountability? While also respecting uh, privacy rights of citizens. And what do we mean by promoting accountability? It's not just posting it online, it's certainly putting it on YouTube, and we'll talk about what we've done there and the reasons that we've done that. But how can we use our video data in very real ways to increase uh, accountability? Well, the ultimate goal is to improve policing. You know, it could be through the use of videos in real world training, but it could be through the use of videos as a better, better indicator or a better use in terms of an early warning system, which many Seattle's developing or has developed. Many of the departments around the table are these early warning systems that go along with, with consent decrees. But let me end by the, the question that really preoccupies my thinking, uh, our thinking, and I hope will help us, you know, the discussion throughout the day, hear your thoughts on uh, sort of uh, <clears throat> throughout the day that, that something we haven't answered, and we can't figure out, and we're struggling through. The chief has said many times, we don't know what we don't know. So we got 360 terabytes of dash cam video. I don't know how much body worn video we currently have. It's a small, uh, very small percentage of that. Only time that video comes to our attention is where there's a use of force incident, a citizen complaint, a lawsuit, it's used in a criminal case. That's four, I'm trying to think of five or six. So there's a handful of times where that videos can come to the attention of the chief or to, or to anybody in that chain of command. That leaves the large majority of the video data that we collect stored somewhere that we're not looking at. So every time that it comes to the chief's desk where we have an officer engaged in problematic behavior, this is gonna happen across the country, you know, the expectation or the questions being asked now is, why didn't you know that? Why didn't you know that that officer was doing that before? And then you start pulling video, whether it's dash cam or soon to be body cam, why did we know that uh, that officer was engaged in problematic behavior before it came to the attention? And citizens, are, the public's gonna hold us accountable for that. So we gotta work through those issues, not just on the providing public access to increase transparency. It is, we're collecting all that video data. How are we gonna use it in terms of accountability to improve, improve the field of policing? So those are just my thoughts on what, when we had these discussions, both at the White House, follow-up conversations with the Police Foundation, uh, Code for America, who's one of our co-sponsors, co Dallas PD, which is one of the first departments that called us saying, hey, what are you guys doing on this issue? What are you guys doing around uh, how do you handle your, your video data? Those are some of our thoughts about what we hope will help guide the conversation today and will also hopefully help generate some ideas that. You know, we're, we're, we're just, as the chief said, trying to, and the mayor said, trying to be creative and think through some of this. We certainly don't have all the answers. So what I'd like to do is just get a reaction, and I'm going to sit down because I want it to be more of a conversation, get a reaction from uh, two of our co-hosts today. 
and then open it up for some wider conversation about sort of the broad issue. And then we'll get into, we'll, we'll, we'll take a break because uh, we want to expand the tables a little bit, let you refresh your coffee. Uh, we'll take a, a quick, very, very quick break uh, and then get into sort of a case study of what we've done in Seattle. So first I'd like to go to uh, uh, Jim Birch, uh, who's uh, I've known for probably as long as I've known Chief O'Toole since the mid-90s. Uh, he was a long-time Department of Justice uh, uh, when the Department of Justice leadership. And I did tell Jim, by the way, when he came here, that this is Seattle c casual. You know, we like to wear jeans. We like to think we're in the tech industry. We like to be cool and hip. Jim is a product to Washington, D.C. I said, Jim, you know, we're going to have jeans on. I might not even wear a jacket. So his response was to take his tie off. He couldn't even, he couldn't <laughs> force himself to get more casual than simply taking his, which I'm sure was a red tie to begin with. But Jim's now at the Police Foundation. And for those of you who don't know, the Police Foundation is a, a national research and think tank that's at the forefront of police innovation. And they've been at the forefront of police innovation uh, since the 1970s, helping the field think through uh, some very tricky issues. They've certainly taken a leadership role uh, and, and working with the White House and DOJ and many departments around the country thinking through, through uh, body, the, these body camera issues. So instead of, I told Jim, instead of having him stand up here and provide the remarks, he's glad to be here, really want him to react to sort of how I was setting the stage and get his thoughts on what he's also seeing sort of nationwide. So Jim. Thanks, Mike. Um, and Mike obviously missed the fact that I'm wearing a striped shirt. Right. And of course, in Washington, we would never wear a striped shirt, so uh, I have to correct you on that, Mike. Uh, it's great to be here, and I, I think Mike's points are, are absolutely right on target. Um, you know, the issue that we are dealing with is not so much technology adoption. Uh, that, that is the issue we'll be talking about here today, and we'll, we'll all pre be prepared to learn from, uh, from Seattle's experiences. But the issue that really, I think, uh, has motivated all of us to engage in this uh, much more aggressively is the issue of relationships with our communities. And that's the issue that police executives have to grapple with uh, more than any, anything related to technology adoption. As Mike talked about, uh, the context is critically important. You know, as more and more video is released, people will begin to see things about uh, policing and the way uh, neighborhoods are, are policed, or, or the lack thereof that they have not before known. And policing is not often a, a, a pretty business. It's not known for its uh, eloquence. It's not, not known necessarily for its uh, cleanness, if you will. It's a difficult job. It's a difficult profession. And I think there are many in our communities who have not seen that before. Uh, you can watch uh, the television shows and get one perspective, but it, it truly does not match reality. And for anyone who's been in law enforcement, you know that uh, for, uh, very, very clearly. So context is critically important, and this technology, no matter how good we become at adopting uh, or adapting the technology, will not solve the larger question. And the larger question is how do we improve our relationships with communities? How do we build that trust? How do we use accountability as a tool to help build that trust and ultimately build legitimacy? And when we talk about legitimacy in this context, what we really mean by it is the consent of the people to be governed. Um, that really is what we mean when we talk about legitimacy. And body cameras and the video that uh, is produced as a result of that can be very, very important in that context. Um, so I, I think Mike is absolutely right. There is a dearth of research uh, on the impact of body-worn cameras, but as Mike points out, uh, that is rapidly changing. There are, there are a lot of uh, research is currently underway. The federal government has made significant investments, significant in, in relation to federal investments. Um, in this area, and so we will begin to see that changing rapidly. But we, I think in the meantime, we have to pay attention and, and, and talk to each other and learn from each other. As I heard uh, a chief in, uh, in Maryland just before I left Washington, D.C. area earlier this week talking about his concern is not so much uh, what people will see as a result of, of having the video available, but whether or not people in the community will still feel comfortable talking to the police because they depend on that. And in many communities, um, communities of, of new Americans or immigrant communities, they may not be comfortable talking to the police to begin with, much less when they have a camera that's recording all of the, the conversation. So these are the things that I think we need to work through. And I think that's why I'm so happy the Police Foundation is thrilled to be a part of this meeting. And I have to commend Chief O'Toole and uh, Mike and the entire team here of Seattle Police Department. Uh, just this week, the National Institute of Justice released a paper on, uh, from its executive session on policing that talked about what police leadership really is. 
And you know, it talked about how, in many ways, we've looked at police leadership as a chief that is a strong leader. But what this paper says is really the, the mark of strong leadership in law enforcement is an organization that's willing to learn differently and to learn throughout the ranks and learn in a very open way. And that's exactly what Seattle Police Department has done here so well. So I, I have to commend uh, Chief O'Toole and Mike and the entire team here for Seattle PD for doing this in the way that they have, for being open to bring the community in, um, bring people in to help challenge our ideas and our thoughts and be a part of this process, and then to go even further and extend this opportunity to all of us from around the country to learn from them. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Now, the Chief has said, I mean, she gets credit for the great leadership, but she has said many times, Jim, you're doing what? You know, <laughs> But that sort of evolved into now she just sort of gives me the evil eye or gives me that look like, all right, but if you screw up, it's easy for you to head out the door and get back on a plane and go back to the East Coast. I'd like to go to uh, uh, someone we're extremely delighted to have here, and she's uh, going to talk to us. She's our keynote at lunch. Uh, but uh, I wanted her to uh, code for America is one of the co-hosts for this as well. They're very, very involved in the uh, – in the uh, White House Police Data Initiative. So we were ecstatic when uh, Jen Palka, who's the founder uh, and executive director of Code for America, could make it up here uh, as, as one of the co-hosts, and again, will be our keynote. She is also, uh, was it the first deputy CTO for the White House, or CTO, it's close enough. She's a very important person in the technology world, but I w wanted her to react to what I said and what Jim said uh, and, and help sort of set the stage for today as well. So, Jen. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'd like to start really with the same note, which is um, not just to commend the two of you, but um, to share how inspired I am by what's been happening here um, and how much I hope that the whole rest of the country is paying attention. Um, I think about a lot of this stuff sort of in the framework of the open government movement, which, you know, has been around for a while, but it started to really take off, I guess, at the beginning of, um, well, there was certainly an inflection point at the beginning of the first Obama administration when they started the administration by saying, you know, every, every agency has uh, two months to tell us how you're going to make your uh, data open and more transparent to the world. And... Um, there, uh, you know, it was very exciting, and I think it really began this um, connection between the technology industry, you know, what we like to call <laughs> geeks, and government again, because that data is sort of like candy for a lot of people who like to play with data and do interesting things with them. And um, I think the framework that, that was proposed at that time was that if we put this data out there, the people will hold us accountable. And there was a lot of skepticism about the people's willingness to look at that amount of data and make sense of that data. And one of the things I think we saw very early on in this is that invitation is in fact not just an invitation to hold government accountable, but to be a part of governing better. Um, to actually help, not just complain, not just point out what is going wrong and what needs to be fixed, but also how the people can play a role in making, in fixing those things and making those things better. And um, to me, that's the real promise of open government. And we have been, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a movement that is still in some ways finding its purpose as we uh, put more data out there. And of course, um, we've got uh, Kevin Merritt and others from Socrata here. So Se Seattle has been a leader in this movement. And you know we're finding all the ways to make this data, whether it's uh, Excel spreadsheets or body cam video, meaningful to the American public. Um, but over the course of this this time that we've been experimenting in this, we're finding these stories um, that really, to me, give enormous hope and enormous meaning to uh, that that phrase, "government for the people, by the people," which is sort of what we do every day. So. Um, I'm very new to the world of policing. Um, I'm very um, happy that we've got Jenny Montoya Tansy here, who's in the back, and we'll move forward, um, who has much uh, stronger background in this. And we actually brought her into Code for America, what is it, about six months ago now, because we decided that if we were going to continue to work with how um, iterative and user-centered and data-driven approaches to technology and government might have a greater impact um, on actual outcomes for the American public and for government that we would need to 
um, not just sort of play in demonstration projects all around different areas, but really focus in certain places where we thought we could have a big impact. And it was certainly, you know, before Ferguson, before some of the stuff that really brought it to the national stage that we said, hey, it seems like criminal justice and public safety is a place where we really could have an impact. So um, we brought her on to, um, to help us have a greater impact on this, and we cannot do that unless we are invited in by very brave people <laughs> um, who will let us work with them. So um, I hope that that is another example of one of the sort of um, ways in which maybe strange bedfellows have, have great outcomes. But I'm very inspired by the stories here, and I think it's just a great example, once again, as you sort of mentioned in, in your opening remarks, of how the thing that seems to be the problem is also the solution. And I think many times we think it, 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 the, pu the public can seem like um, uh, certainly uh, have a very strong voice sometimes, but they can also be part of the solution. So thank you for showing us the way. <clears throat> Let me just wrap up before we, because I do want to take a break because we've got too many people at the back of the room, so we can reset the table, get more people around the table. But uh, I do want to hear from Dallas PD. In Dallas was, and I didn't tell them this, we're going to ask them to sort of speak at the beginning. I mean, but Dallas was one of the first that called us, and that's what spurred the original meeting, saying, hey, maybe just Dallas and Seattle are going to talk, to having a much broader meeting. So, uh, Dallas. I, uh, those, those don't, I'm Tom Lawrence. I'm an assistant chief with Dallas, and I've been involved in our technology stuff for the last decade or so. Um, everything that's been said so far is very important, but I want to take another perspective to this, too, that we need to keep in mind that really affected us heavily is how, the, how this, the officers buy into this and what we're doing, and I think we've got to keep that in the back. There's 850,000 law enforcement in this country. Uh, one of the greatest fears we have in Dallas is our officers don't buy in and they lay down. And um, some of you are in law enforcement, some of you have been in the street, that'll kill us. I mean, it will literally ruin us because they can make us fail. Um, so we've, we've ta kind of taken this three-step approach. The first one we've talked about extensively, the transparency issue. Um, you know, that's a, that's a kind of a nebulous subject when you, when you start talking about it, but we've, we've believe that'll help us build public confidence. The second part is how the officers are impacted by the technology and how they use it. Thus far, we've gotten very good buy-in. Uh, we haven't seen us capture a incident on the, like on the screen on the body camera yet either to see what happens. And the third piece of it is the investigative part that we feel there's a great deal of value to that, that we, we actually have already seen that from some of the pilots. We've used some of that video in courtroom. So where we are as far as the cameras, we actually took delivery of the cameras yesterday. So we're, we're through the pilot. Two years it took us. Those you, it took us two years to get here. Uh, we were. I would like to say we were thoughtful. I'm not sure that's the right word. We were probably more uh, learning as we went along, trying to stumble through this. Uh, we, we've tried to take in consideration everything that we're talking about today, but the 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 big thing in the room that we still can't overcome is the open record issue. And that's the biggest reason we contacted Seattle is how we handle redaction and open records. And although we're from Texas and yes, we're considered to be somewhat conservative, we have a very liberal freedom of information laws in the state of Texas. It's a one party consent state and we have, I mean, our information just goes flying out. So we've got to figure out how to handle that rather than us have to take an additional $2 million in budget concerns for the police department to try to redact every minute of video, that's, that's where we really, that's what we hope to achieve here today is get something that will help us move that forward. Thanks, Chief. Well, we break, if you could just, if you're in law enforcement, raise your hand so we show everybody who's here. If you're technology ex, one of our technology experts, raise your hand. Holy cow. If you're one of our privacy experts, raise your hand. Okay, somebody's got to be, we invited some privacy experts. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants to admit that one. Trying to admit that one. So let's take a, a quick break, just 10 minutes. I want to reset the tables, and then we'll give you sort of the Seattle case. So what, I like, what I'd like to do is uh, we'll get into talking about the, the Seattle experience, which is what a number of people wanted to, wanted to hear. Like, how do we get from 
where we were to where we are and where are we, go and where are we going. And there's really, uh, to sort of tell the story, if you will, there's really uh, three or four parallel tracks. And we have a lot of great folks here in the room uh, from the city of Seattle who, who have been involved in those. So I think it's important, uh, one, uh, to understand uh, the very broad public disclosure laws here in Washington that we're forced to, to operate under. The other thing is uh, understanding that through the mayor and then Michael Matt Miller, who I'll go to in a second, uh, the city undertook a, a, a tremendous initiative in terms of privacy. So we've been, we've been doing a lot of work over the past, uh, almost approaching a year now, uh, to, under, to, to, to address privacy concerns across the board. This is not just police department, as Michael will describe it. This is about how we collect, how the city collects data and how we, how we intend to protect privacy. Uh, 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 you know, again, not just the police department, but the other 19, 20 departments within the city. And then understanding sort of our body camera pilot. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that and how all that fit into this open records request and led to a hackathon and led to some of the, the, the creative things that, that we have. So let me, let's first start with our privacy, I mean our public disclosure laws. Probably the very first meeting that I went to, the chief came in, as she said a year ago today, I was on our transition team. It, was, it wasn't until August, so I was in and out. It was in August I was hired uh, full time. That's, or July 29th, I started full time. The very first meeting that I attended as an official employee of the Seattle Police Department was a meeting on public disclosure. And I'll let Mary describe uh, that and, and sort of get everybody on the edge of their seats to understand sort of the, the dilemma we're under. I think if looking back now, I should have walked, or I should have turned around and walked out of the room and told the chief, thanks, but no thanks, I'm going back to the East Coast because if I'd known then sort of the implications for what Mary and others who've been struggling through this issue for many, many, many years, uh, and uh, you know how we would need to really think about this with body cameras. Uh, you know, it, if we put a lot of thought into it, I think we would have pulled our hair out, and not even started the body camera pilot program. And we were actually questioned many times, why don't you just shut it down until you could force the state legislature, legislature to change the, the, the body camera, I mean, the public disclosure laws. That obviously wasn't uh, an option. So Mary, if you could you know, take a few minutes and everyone's heard about how broad our public disclosure laws are. If you could tell them how broad our public disclosure laws are. Yes, I'm Mary Perry, and I'm with the Seattle City Attorney's Office, and I deal exclusively with uh, public records matters, and it's accurate. Uh, uh, Mike had gotten off a plane at 10 o'clock. At 2 o'clock that afternoon, he was in a meeting on public records, which I thought was uh, impressive, that it was a clear message that the new uh, chief was stepping up to the issue, which is uh, a really uh, significant um, challenge and also I was very impressed that the priority was placed there because many agencies don't place the priority on public records that they should. Um, our act in the state of Washington, and this is not to complain about the act, it's just the reality of it and it is an essential function of government to provide data and records to the public. But we have an incredibly broad act that uh, I believe is the most liberal in the, um, the country, and that's a good thing. And where we are is we cannot deny a request solely on the basis of it being overly broad. That means somebody can come in, like Tim Clemens, and ask for every video we have or every email we have. Uh, it's a huge technological challenge to deal with that. We have limited reduction, uh, redactions, rather, very few exemptions that uh, apply uh, broadly. For example, our active investigative uh, exemption applies only while a criminal investigation is ongoing. As soon as it is referred for prosecution, the categorical exemption falls away and we have to go through the file, 
uh, and parse out those parts that can be released, create a, a detailed exemption log. Um, it is uh, unlike many other statutes on that uh, count, and it, it creates a very large administrative burden. Uh, not to say that's a bad thing, it's just something we have to staff. Um, our privacy exemption is very limited. It has to apply to specific types of records like investigative records. Also, it is a tort standard, which means that to be private, information has to be highly offensive to the reasonable individual to be disclosed and of no legitimate interest to the public. It's not a balancing test. We have to meet both of those. So privacy is very limited. Our cost recovery is limited. We cannot recover for redaction costs. We cannot recover processing or search costs. We can only recover the actual cost of copying records. That may be the cost of a DVD. That may be 15 cents a page if something originated as uh, a paper record. Uh, it's a, a, a very small amount when it is electronic records. Um, we have strict liability, even for a good faith error. Uh, we also have attorney's fees and penalties provision, provisions, even for a good faith error, for example. Um, so we have every incentive to produce records to the public as well as broadly uh, and as efficiently as possible. On the other side, we have the technological challenges. And video uh, presents technological challenges like no other record. We thought email was hard. Video is particularly challenging. Uh, the sheer volume of it. You think of how much video gets produced in just one shift. Uh, SPD has over 300 terabytes of in-car video alone. And we were involved in a lawsuit uh, in, with one of the local TV stations. It's called Fisher Broadcasting versus City of Seattle. And just about a year ago, the Supreme Court ruled against us uh, on our interpretation of our Privacy Act, which is our two-party consent law. And SPD had interpreted that in a way that would uh, allow us to withhold uh, videos for a period of three years up to the statute of limitations based on language in the statute. In a 5-4 decision, the state Supreme Court said that that was incorrect. Um, and that left us with uh, having to produce essentially every single video that we have, in-car video or body cams. The in-car video uh, would be exempt only while there was an active investigation and possibly while there was uh, active litigation involved. Body cams are no longer categorically exempt once the active investigation has been referred. There may be other exemptions that apply but the way our law uh, acts is that we have to redact rather than withhold. So the lessons that I take from Fisher as guiding principles are that we must be able as an agency to provide responsive public records regardless of what type of record they are, whether they are electronic or digital. We must understand our systems and be able to communicate those systems to requesters. I think Opportunities like this to educate the public are essential. It's really important to know how difficult it is to deal with this. For one thing, uh, our systems do not communicate. We have um, no direct correlation between the, for example, Coban in-car video system and our RMS system. So tagging videos and locating them and finding which one applies to a particular incident is a challenge. Uh, we're trying to work through that. I know the industry is trying to work through that, but it's still developing. It's, it's kind of like having a big barrel full of DVDs and you reach in and they're unlabeled and you <coughs> don't know whether you're getting gone with the wind or the godfather or, you know, somebody's birthday party. It's very hard to locate all of that. Um, we don't have efficient 
an effective redaction capability yet. That's one of the reasons we're here. Because we cannot withhold a video if only part of it is exempt, we have to redact it. That in itself is a huge technological challenge. First of all, where in the video is the redactable content? Our PDU is, has just gotten the capability to fast forward through our in-car video. So it's a real-time exercise. You also have to find the audio, and you have to be able to redact that. That's challenging as well. The technology is just catching up, and it hasn't completely caught up with the challenge we have. Um, then along came Tim Clemens, and he made massive requests. And um, it, you know, I have to give him credit because I have not seen our Public Records Act on the front page of the local newspaper in any other context beside an agency um, being dinged for violation. He brought it to the attention of the public. I think it, yeah, he deserves applause for what he did. Uh, as a matter of fact, somebody in the department accused me of making the request just to, get, <laughs> just to bring attention to the problem. Um, that led to our hackathon and to what you'll hear as the two-prong approach, which is um, to try to have as much proactive transparency as possible. It doesn't comply with the Public Records Act, but the ultimate goal is to, first of all, give people an ability to screen the videos, and then they can ask for the content they want. Uh, get as much out there, uh, as widely available as possible. And then for public records, try to develop auto-redaction, auto-tagging, ways to um, expedite and make this uh, an efficient process. Hopefully, the two will converge at some point so that we can put the, redact the auto-redacted uh, content out there that would meet most public records. Uh, responses. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, in Washington, and I think it, this should be everywhere, uh, technical barriers do not uh, warrant denying a request. And technical barriers that uh, are posed by the video and the, uh, our ability to redact them, they are huge hurdles and we are working through them. And um, the courts I think need to be educated regarding how difficult this is. That doesn't mean that, and the legislature as well, that doesn't mean that we should be off the hook. But people, including requesters, have to understand the technological burden, especially of these huge requests we receive. Uh, we can produce records by installments, but when somebody comes in and asks for thousands and thousands of videos, it's a huge uh, uh, it, it's a huge burden on the agency in um, the resources that we have to apply to it, our technological issues that are um, uh, posed by it. That's why the transparency efforts are so important. The more we can get out there, the more we can help people make the targeted requests and they can look <laughs> at basically everything else by way of uh, this transparency effort. So thank you. Thanks, Mary. <clears throat> and how much has the city paid out because we didn't disclose uh, information versus how much has the city paid out uh, because we disclosed too much? Uh, we've paid out about $2 million in uh, settlements and judgments for violations over the years. And how much have we been penalized because we put out too much information? Zero. Zero. Because there is a good faith harbor in our Public Records Act. If we are trying to comply with the Public Records Act in good faith and we put out something that violates somebody's right to privacy, uh, there is no liability. And also because the privacy standard is so high that it is a tort. We have to commit essentially the tort of invasion of privacy in order to be liable for uh, putting out too much. Uh, though privacy is an issue. I mean, it's a huge issue, and it's a real concern, and that's why effective redaction is so important. We have our friends from uh, Flor from Orlando here. Uh, what's your initial gut reaction? Because they usually compare 
Washington State to Florida in terms of sunshine laws or, and our FOIA laws? We do face those challenges where a lot of information is requested, but very little limitations on how much information we can keep and not share. And that's what we're going through right now, um, our issues. For the city of Orlando, for example, more often than not, we're in the news for the number of visitors that come to Central Florida, 62 million last year. This year, we've been on the news for a lot of issues involving our officers, which is unheard of for us. We did participate in a one-year study for the body-worn camera program. We're moving forward um, with the purchase of additional cameras. The funding source is the issue right now, waiting to see what the federal side of the house will provide versus what we can do as a city. And, uh, and those are the, the, specific, the specific concerns that we're facing. You know, how do we go about meeting those public records requests? We are currently receiving those very unusual, very large requests, and, and it is a challenge. The redaction process is the most challenging of all. Um, Captain Sue Mann here is uh, in charge of our uh, Body One Program project that we're working on right now. But again, we agree completely with you. Uh, it's, it's, it's a task that we don't know how to meet right now. Right, I was just gonna say that uh, politicians often think that body cams are cheap. Cost a few hundred dollars to outfit an officer. The back end costs are astronomical by comparison and agencies have to be aware of those back end costs before they commit to a program. So <clears throat> I wanted Mary to provide sort of that as context. As she mentioned, that was the first meeting I went to, and now everybody thinks I'm an expert on public disclosure laws. Here's the cheat sheet. I didn't read through it. Mary provided me a primer. Here's the, you know, here's every city official needs to understand public disclosure laws in Washington State. I, I have ADD, sort of like the chief. I, after 140 characters, I stopped reading. My understanding is we just got to give everything up. So when we get these requests coming through, I'm looking to Mary and our team. It's not how do we not disclose that information is how are we going to provide that information and coming out of that first meeting uh, that Mary described when, when we came in when we came into the department we put together a project team and said go find the technology that can help us better redact uh, this video now this is before body worn this is on our dash cam so fast forward the team did a lot of work internal team partners th throughout the city sent out a request for information into September, October, right. came back, there's nothing out there. There was, there's nothing, no. you know, we were looking for, can we just go buy something? Just tell us how much it costs. We'll buy something off the shelf and we'll give it to our public disclosure unit and our lives will be a lot better. So that is a very broad public disclosure laws, teams working on it. There's no technology out there that's going to help us at the time. So that's sort of one track that we were heading down. The second, and I'll bring Michael Matt Miller, who's the, Chief Technology Officer for the City of Seattle. Uh, he started a few days after Chief O'Toole uh, was sworn in. So I'd, I'd, you're, you're approaching your one year anniversary as well, Michael, I'm sure. And he met with the Chief, I think on the day that he was getting sworn in uh, by or being uh, uh, confirmed and then sworn in uh, that day. And he came to meet with the Chief and myself and we were talking about a number of different uh, issues and establishing, and we've established a great partnership one of the things that Michael asked uh, was, would the police department be a co-sponsor of this new privacy initiative that he was gonna kick off at the, under the direction of the mayor? So Michael, could you talk a little bit about our, our privacy initiative? Because that's the second parallel track to understand about how we got to where we are here in Seattle. Sure, uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Mike mentioned, my name is Michael Matt Miller. I'm the chief technology officer for the city. And today is actually my one year anniversary. Um, I started on the same day that the chief was sworn in. So chief, congratulations. We both made it a year. We'll have a big, we'll have a cake at lunch time. Right. a big party. <laughs> <laughs> so just a little bit about my background. Um, I come to the city after a number of years spent in um, IT governance, privacy, and security. And most recently before the city, I was at Microsoft where I worked um, in trustworthy computing in the privacy group. So, so privacy and helping people trust and how data is collected and used is very important to me. So when I came to the city, it was very interesting that in my first week, I received a phone call from one of our city council members who said, you know, you've got to help me out. We've got this privacy challenge in the city. Uh, and specifically, he was talking about several events that have occurred over the past few years. Uh, events like 
the city, uh, you may have heard, bought a couple of drones. And despite trying to educate the public on how they would be used, um, there's a very strong reaction to that purchase. Um, there was the installation of some surveillance cameras um, that were funded through a DHS grant. And, and while the intent was positive to use those cameras to monitor our, our waterfront, um, you know, some of them weren't configured correctly. There wasn't a, a real clear understanding, again, by the public of, of how the imagery from those cameras would be used. And so, again, uh, the public had a large uh, outcry to that, that program. So the council accurately realized we need to have a way of all up communicating to the public, um, not only when there's a new privacy impacting technology that we plan to introduce, but that it's not just about, you know, technology, a camera, a drone, a, a specific object. Technology is moving too fast and data is collecting so rapidly, just like body-worn video camera, that it's not possible to have a one-size-fits-all approach to privacy. So what we did here in the city is we worked with the mayor and the council to create our privacy initiative, an initiative where we sought to identify and define a set of principles through which we would make decisions affecting the public's privacy. So we kicked this off last year. Um, we formed an interdepartmental team with representatives from across 10 departments in the city police, fire, parks, transportation, any department that has a very unique, or I should even say a general use case, around how it is we collect data from the public. Uh, video cameras, um, application forms for things like our utility discount program, um, even folks from our utilities, because when you um, use our services, you're generating information about how you consume water and electricity that some people might consider sensitive. So over the past year, we've gone through a process through which we've defined six principles uh, by which we will make decisions going forward. Um, principles that think about things like um, data minimization. Is it really necessary to collect information from the public in all circumstances? Uh, things like notice and consent. Is it um, really necessary that we collect a piece of data or is it kind of a nice to have and if so, how are we informing the public of why we're collecting that information and giving choice about whether they can opt out of that collection? Um, so those principles were introduced to our council in March of this year by the mayor, and we were very pleased that the council passed a resolution uh, driving the adoption of those across the city. And so I know I keep with me now my wallet card um, that has the six principles on it, and um, we'll be producing more of these soon. Michael, you're such a privacy geek. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, it says, number one, we value your privacy. So if anyone asks, I can <laughs> point out how we value your privacy. <laughs> So the next steps for us, um, we've really had a great success driving this awareness of the challenge across the city, driving awareness of all the ways that we are now collecting data. Now we have to drive some behavior change in the city. So our next commitment is to put together what we're calling a privacy toolkit, a, a set of materials that will allow us to, one, educate city employees about you know, all the ways we might be collecting data and not realizing it. Um, as Mary was talking about with the Public Records Act, um, there are some very informal ways we collect data that could have real privacy harms. Receiving an email from the public and the public not realizing that what you put in an email most likely can be disclosed upon request. Um, filling out an application for some type of government service potentially can be disclosed. So really helping people be smarter about what we collect, how we tell people, and driving a, a process that's called a privacy impact assessment. So before you start a new program, before you start an initiative, giving our employees easy to use tools that help people think you know, how will the public perceive this program? What is the potential privacy harm that could come if we collect this information? And through that assessment process, helping people use consistent templates and tools to minimize data collection, to, to mitigate risk, and most importantly, communicate consistently with the public about how and why we're collecting their data. So that's coming out in August, and we look forward um, to working with SPD and the other departments. Uh, Mike has been a great co-sponsor of this initiative, and we've worked very closely together. Um, so we will be rolling out in August, and. Uh, Look forward to updating everyone in this room on how it's going. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> and to Bill Schreier, who's former CTO, but he's, uh, if you follow his Twitter account, he's, I don't know how much time he still spends in the state of Washington. He's across the country. He's a real expert on uh, many of these matters. Bill, do you have a reaction to sort of uh, what you hear from Michael and how the city is moving in terms of privacy and what you're seeing throughout the country uh, in, your, in your dealings with FirstNet and some of the other technology initiatives that you're involved in? Uh, th thank you, Michael. Um, yes, so I chair the State Interoperability Executive Committee and I'm also the FirstNet state point of contact for Washington. Has anybody here heard of FirstNet? Well, there you go. Um, I think you are on the leading edge. Seattle is on the leading edge of this for cities uh, around the nation. Uh, certainly, uh, you're uh, and obviously on the leading edge in terms of the uh, 
the redaction of video, although many states uh, are struggling with this at, at the moment. Um, also, I think uh, the technology challenge was mentioned earlier. I wrote a blog post about six months ago about all the back-end challenges, Mary, that there are, are to the technology, which again, the legislature um, and political leaders d definitely don't understand, especially the cost of it, which everybody in this room is aware of as well. So again, um, I commend Seattle for taking this forward in terms of the privacy, especially on these little bitty things that you don't think about. The, the email message that has all this metadata, this, this underlying data attached to it, which is really can be a violation of the individual's rights without them even knowing it. Thanks, Bill. So, and, and, and I appreciate Michael and Bill and Mary giving us credit for, you know, the chief and I, what we're doing. No, they're, they're the real experts, and they've, they've, they've assembled, whether it's on the public disclosure side or the privacy side, they've, they've assembled a lot of uh, great experts within the city and outside experts to help us deal with it. But So that's sort of several lenses to think about what I'm getting ready to tell you with, here's how we're operating, here's the context that we have to operate under public disclosure, which is give up everything. Same time, Michael uh, and others have been doing some really thoughtful work in the city around privacy. So that, that, that certainly has influenced our thinking as we've gone along, but more so once the privacy toolkit is developed, it'll help us operationalize those principles when we start thinking about not just the body camera program, not just how we're going to release the data, but in, in many other areas as well. So uh, if we didn't have the privacy initiative going along that parallel track, we'd be in a real hole as well because we wouldn't be thinking through the privacy issues as much as we have over the, over the course of the year. And before I tell the story, Bill, you, you, you had one more thing you were going to say? Yes, I apologize to the chief and to Michael Matt Miller. Uh, the surveillance cameras that he was talking about on the waterfront and the drones, those occurred on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I helped accept that grant. So you can, uh, you can finger me for the, the responsibility for that. <laughs> well, Bill, I'll let the Orlando folks wanted to talk to us about our surveillance cameras. They heard we had a great program. I didn't respond to his email. I didn't want to tell him where we were. So you can talk to Bill later, and he'll, he'll fill you in on why we don't have surveillance cameras uh, uh, in downtown Seattle. And drones went to L.A. Yeah, we, we sold them at a good price to the LAPD. So now L.A. has them grounded in a warehouse as well. They're, they can't fly them either. So we had that going on. And so about October of the year, uh, we get this uh, request for any and all of our dash cam video. 300, as Mary said, 360 plus terabytes of dash cam video. I mean, and we, we were, were, and this is part of the issue I'm sure will come up throughout the day. It's a big issue. I know our, you know, we, th we should be putting a lot more thought in terms of on the law enforcement side is, are our data retention schedules? We're, we're holding 360 terabytes of data because of our consent decree. And we couldn't prove to the monitor in the U.S. court at the time that we could reliably, reliably retrieve the video that they wanted. So hopefully we're, we're almost there now because uh, we made some changes uh, with the technology that we had uh, last fall. And we're working with the monitor in the court to, to get back to what state law is, which is three years. And we'll, so it's 90 days. 90 days. 90 days or the um, uh, retention period for the particular event it's related to. So then we'll be able to dump, we won't be holding 360 terabytes of dash cam video. But at the time we had 360 terabytes of dash cam video and we get a request for any and all of that 360 plus terabytes of video, which is 1.78 million videos that, that we have. It's from an anonymous requester. So our team gets together and again, Mary works for city law, so she's sort of, she's our outside expert. It really was, and I've, I've said this before, that it really was like a, a DDoS attack on the police department. It was, gonna, it was going to, the reaction among our team, and trying to think through how we were gonna provide, how we were gonna redact all that video, it was, it was gonna seize up the system. Right? No one could think through how, as you, as you heard Mary say, we gotta give up everything essentially, and we didn't have the technology at the time uh, to redact it. So everyone started going through the permutations of how long it was going to take us to redact 1.7, 1.8 million videos, which is absurd to even think about. So 
the requester happens to be sitting to my right here, who's now a, I'll fast forward, is a police department employee. We engaged him, right? It, we, we didn't know what to do, and, and uh, the chief from Dallas, I believe, was said that you know, they've been stumbling through. The, we didn't have a project plan on any of this as well. This was, it really just developed organically. It was ta after talking to Mary, sitting around going, what are we going to do? We were having, I was having, eating a sandwich at my uh, uh, desk, and Bill knows from being on Twitter, we all love Twitter, right? Uh, we just engaged him on Twitter because he was firing off these messages to the police department. So I simply asked him, what was he looking for? Now, I can't remember the, the exact tweet, but he got right back to me. Uh, and I said, if you drop your request, we'll set up a meeting the next day and talk about you know, what you're looking for, how we can provide it. And also we can show you uh, our limitations. It's not as easy as simply you know, pointing and clicking and we're gonna produce all this, this uh, uh, video data for you. And let, let me just say, we were burning to, to think about how in the Stone Age that we were currently moving out of, we were burning 7,000 DVDs per month, mm -hmm. satisfying public disclosure requests. That's outside of what Tim was trying to do to us. We were burning 7,000 DVDs per month, satisfying these public disclosure requests at the time. Which again, and I'll introduce our new CIO who comes to us from Amazon that we're very lucky to have. But think it, I don't even have a device that I can play a DVD on currently. You know, we have iPhones, iPads, everything else. That's how the police department was delivering when we finally did clear the video to any requester. So we engaged him on uh, social media, on Twitter. And I think that's sort of what caught everyone's attention, but it was, we didn't know what to do. It was really, everyone was sort of seizing up. He was still firing off these tweets to us, and we said, well, why don't you, why don't you work with us? So we, the next day, uh, I think it was on a Thursday, on a Friday, uh, we, uh, Tim came in. Uh, we did, I think he stayed up all night preparing for the meeting. And I think Tim also stayed up all night last night preparing for this meeting. That's how excited he is. We bought pizza. We had our technology folks, and this is pre-bringing Greg Russell, and, and Mary was there uh -huh. as well. And we started a conversation. What are you looking for? What are you trying to accomplish? Why are you killing us with these requests? Let's show you what we're currently doing. And I think Tim got a better understanding of the challenges that, that, that we were facing. And we also got a better understanding of where he was coming from. And he, it wasn't to be annoying. It wasn't to be a public disclosure, a PDR terrorist, I think is one person called him. Uh, or they've called him worse uh, than that. Tim was very thoughtful in, in trying to think uh, about the issues of transparency and privacy. It wasn't, hey, I'm just going to be annoying. I want to get all this video and I want to post it to YouTube. It was, I mean, there, he was thinking more thoughtfully about transparency and privacy than many of us inside the police department and the city were thinking about transparency and privacy. So Tim comes into the scene we engage him. He does as, as promised. He dropped his request uh, the very next day, which everybody, you know, sort of a, a big sigh of relief. But now we have to deliver. So the chief coming into this said, you know, uh, coming into after she was appointed, and we've had conversations was, uh, and this is sort of fit into the larger story here is, you know, we're going to Seattle. This is tech hub, one of the tech hubs of, not just the country, but the world, right? This is Microsoft. This is you know, all the companies that are based here. You know, how do we take advantage of local tech talent to help the police department become second to none when it uses and how it uses technology? And before, that's just a chief thinking, and we haven't, we haven't figured it out. So now we have this guy, Tim, who's a local coder, hacker, whatever you want to call him, who comes into the scene. So we started thinking, well, how can we take advantage of Tim's talent? He obviously, he came into that meeting on Friday, the next day, with a program already written to, hey, let me show you how we can over-redact all the video that you have. And he gave it to me. Tim, I don't, I don't know what to do with this. You know, we, we didn't, at the time, we were still having these sort of these philosophical questions, but he stayed up all night writing that code. So that triggered, if, if we got people like Tim who wanted to be a pain in the rear end and request everything, there's gotta be other 
people out there, as the chief said, you know, in the community who would want to help the police department solve some of our problems. So we organized a hackathon. I know a lot of, and you know, we talk about this at the White House uh, Police Data Initiative, and people, you know, talk about doing hackathons. And we threw it together, and thanks to Sean Wickham, who's, who's uh, sitting at the table, and uh, some of his staff. I mean, really, uh, within maybe a two-week time frame, we didn't know what we were doing. It was, we're going to open this up. We're going to try to attract other people like Tim. He says he has his code that's going to do great things for us. Maybe he does. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't. He does not. Can we bring other people around the table as well who, let's see if he does, and let's see if others can help improve upon what he has. So we had a hackathon at the, the end of December. And there are some people in this room that came to the hackathon, including I think Bill was here as well, Mary. It, it was a, a scene straight out of central casting. It was, if you, it was in this room. If you walked in here, and I'm looking at Marcus from Taser was here as one of our sort of technology experts, you had people in this room who, like Tim, they like to sit, stay up all night and code, so they look like what typical programmers may look like, a lot of hoodies, a lot of very tight jeans, sort of the very, you know, <laughs> when you walk around Seattle, you'll see them, just look for them, especially as you get closer to Amazon and others down uh, north in the town. Hey, I'm profiling. We had people sitting. <laughs> we had people in this room who had sued the department and Mary talked about the $2 million that we paid out. We had guys that had gotten part of that payout uh, who had sued us. You know, they contacted us and said, hey, can we come to this hackathon? We said, sure, absolutely. We had people sitting around the table who I know, and this is the end of December, because I've seen them, who had been taking part in the Ferguson Black Lives Matter protest. I've seen them out in, on the front lines the weekend before. So we had all these, this eclectic group around the table trying to, and the, the astonishing thing was, trying to help us solve a problem. So we may have differences with the guys that sued us in one. We may have differences with the people who were protesting us over, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter issues. But around this one issue, they had some talent that, that they came together and tried to help us solve. At the end of the day, Tim's code won out. Right? We didn't have a, it wasn't judged really, it, was, it wasn't your typical hackathon where we sat around the table and people got new ideas and improved upon the code and threw it back up there. It's more presentations, but it worked. And at the end of the day, it was, yeah, Tim really does have the best code that we can think of to look at this over, to, to over-redact. And also what happened coming out of that is that Tim met other people who had been thinking about this issue. Yeah, right. There were ex, there were folks here who worked for micro, who were, you know ex Microsoft folks and others who've been who've been thinking about this for a long time. So he was able to get in touch with others who've been thinking about video uh, uh, facial detection, you know, not blurring but capturing the face, capturing the body. So that's at the end of December. <clears throat> so we have now we have outside local tech talent on board, ready to help us. We got to figure out how to how, what to do with it. Three days. Two days later, no, excuse me, one day later, we launched our body-worn video pilot. So the mayor came out in August after Ferguson and said, the police department will get our body-worn camera pilot program going. They had, the city, the department had started one in 2013, Bob, and for a variety of reasons, much like shelving the drones and shelving the surveillance cameras and other issues, the body-worn camera pilot had been put on hold as well. So the mayor announced in August, get it going again. So we had a whole team on a fourth parallel track working on the body-worn camera pilot program. And they were doing a, a tremendous job, and, and we could talk about it later in the day about how we got to where we were with, the, with uh, developing the policy and other things. But that kicked off a few days uh, the next day after we had the hackathon. And, and that's what led to merging the body-worn pilot and what we'll call the over-redaction pilot together. We had this code going on, but we couldn't think about what we're going to, were we going to run the 360 terabytes of dash cam video through it and release it. But it made sense because we only had 12 officers, volunteers, involved in the body cam 
project to, to merge it together. So you go through the holidays, get to January, December, these guys are continuing to refine the code, and then it's time to do something. And that people were looking at us. You had a hackathon, you invited us in, you said you were going to follow up, and, 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 and what are you gonna do? And I give it to credit to Sean and, and Jonah and some of the other folks. It was, well, we have the code, we have the video now, which is more manageable, what's next? Well, it was sort of, what do you do with the video, what does citizens do with the video that they record on their smartphone that we're talking about? They upload it to YouTube. So I would love to take credit for that idea. Now, I do try to take credit often for it when I give talks about it. But really it was Sean and his guys thinking through this, saying, well, why don't we upload our video to YouTube? And that's what launched everything. Take the code, take the body cam data, upload it to YouTube over Blurred, and let's see what happens. And that has led to, you know, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to Tim in a second, who's gonna walk through how we went from that YouTube launch of overblurring the data, which is just a pilot, it was just a pilot program, it's just an experiment. We knew that it was sort of the start of something. We also knew, by the way, and we're waiting, that our technology friends, like Taser, like Vivu, like Microsoft, and others at some point are gonna solve this problem for us. But we couldn't wait till they came up with, came up with a better solution. So before I let Tim give his presentation you know, of, of where we are going, and then I'll ask Greg uh, to really sort of provide the, the, the big view, uh, the, the global view, just wanna ask Bob Mead to take a few minutes to describe where we are on the body camera pilot uh, program itself because that will provide the sort of context as we, as we wrap up the pi body camera pilot, uh, how this is gonna feed into our over-redaction program. Thanks, Mike. So I, I will make this, this brief and uh, to the point as best I can. Um, it was about a year ago when we first started looking at uh, body-worn camera. And technically, we were capable. Uh, policy, training, deployment-wise, incapable. We didn't have those things together yet. So it took about, uh, from this time, as, as Mike was saying, to late in December for us to really get ready to go do it. And it's the value of this meeting I really appreciate because if it took us six months then, and we're gonna go to deployment in the future, it'll probably take another six months to make sure we are engaged with our community, our, our policies, the privacy acts, we will uh, distribute that information and engage uh, those stakeholders around us. So. Uh, this is really valuable and great timing as far as our project team um, would say. I <coughs> co-managed this with the Lieutenant Grennan who was out on uh, military duty uh, for about a month. Uh, and I like the statement earlier that police work isn't pretty. He would say police work is messy if he was here. That's how he always uh, he says it's not always predictable. It can be messy. So we have 12 officers from his precinct and we have them on all shifts and uh, we have bikes, beat, and patrol. So we're trying to cover each avenue of police officer involvement that we can. We have found that um, the, there's an attitude change between the public and the officer. We haven't, with the size of 12, been able to actually do measurements on it. It's not a large enough pool. But every officer you ask who's engaged in it say, well, I, I recognize some difference. The public is more accepting and uh, we find that the officers can use that training, uh, excuse me, the video for training purposes. Uh, one of the officers is a field training officer and she uses it and I just love watching her video because you can see how she's just working with her, uh, her trainee and, and bringing that, that officer to be a great, a great officer. And she goes, let's go look at that video. Uh, so she's very good about using it. Um, we are doing two 90 day pilots. Uh, first we did uh, taser and they're back in, and then the second part, which we're on now, we use the V-View camera. So we aren't assessing this camera over that camera. Our pilot is based on gathering requirements, how do we set training, how do we establish a good deployment, um, what is our spares and operational uh, you know, perspective, how do we take care of it once we roll it out, how much storage will we need, can we collect enough data today to forecast what's gonna be going on in the future. So we have about 10 days, I think, left, maybe two weeks, 
and at the end of that, we will combine the requirements that we actually started collecting on the second week. So we actually have, I don't know, 90 or 100 requirements that we've been able to collect based on surveys that we conduct with the officers, uh, with their supervisors, uh, with people within the organization. We have found, as you've heard today, our force review board likes to have that additional view. They like it when an officer leaves the car and they go around the corner, that in-car video quits working, but they still have footage. They really like that. Um, it is a great investigative tool, um, but that's beyond the capability of the pilot. But uh, again, we're, we're looking to wrap up our pilot and uh, we'll be working with a, uh, an RFP team to uh, combine all our requirements and set that out. And based on Mike's timing, maybe six to seven months from now, we will have chosen uh, a supplier and our policies and training uh, will have been completed to uh, address a, a rollout. The chief just said six or seven weeks from now, Bob. She's, she gets a little impatient. So you guys <laughs> need to speed it up a little bit. The monitor just releases uh, the, oh, the chief. Yeah, she has a very expedited timeline on everything. Uh, the uh, monitor just released his uh, uh, latest semi-annual report uh, last week, uh, and in that he calls for us to move as quickly as possible uh, to deploy body cameras across the entire department, or uh, across all the patrol. Uh, so we're working on that. We will have to issue an RFP uh, in this Seattle. We can't sole source it. We'll have to issue an RFP and have vendors that don't. So let, let, let me now turn this over to to Tim and let him you know, walk you through where we're, where we're going as the body camera pilot wraps up, as we do the RFP, as we're learning from uh, our YouTube experiment, uh, where we hope to head. And, and let me just say that uh, 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 Tim's been called a lot of names, and, and I forget half of them. Mary and I uh, laugh at some of the names he's been called. He helped us as a volunteer from what was that, the end of October into November until the chief finally said about two months ago that, hey, this guy is giving us everything. He, you know, are we taking advantage of him? So we hired him as a temporary employee uh, about a month. Is, he's, been, he's been on the job uh, about a month ago. And again, to, 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 to keep giving credit to good leadership, if we didn't have the leadership of the chief and the, and the mayor, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many departments could hire somebody with Tim's background, and not in a bad way, but Tim's background to bring him into the department, because we caught a lot of heat. Uh, we've done a lot, a lot of other things, but uh, it, you know police departments. You guys know there's a very traditional way of thinking about things. Bringing someone like Tim into the department was a very different way of thinking about the problem, but it has been a tremendous benefit thinking through this uh, issue, and the things that he comes up with daily uh, I think has amazed our, our, our internal staff. So I would encourage folks to think outside, I hate to use the metaphor, think outside the box, but think differently about how to bring that local tech talent, whomever they may be, uh, into the fold to figure out how to solve these problems. So, Tim? Good morning. Uh, I can tell you that uh, when I uh, made my request on September 22nd, uh, I just kind of heard about, you know, a TV station uh, winning a lawsuit. And quite frankly, I thought they were getting like, you know, thousands or millions of videos. Um, and I was irritated that these guys are just showing little clips on TV and that they only care about Seattle. So that's kind of what uh, launched me into uh, uh, being a records requester. And, um, you know, I, I just kind of have this idea that uh, the public uh, should have true public access that um, public records um, really kind of right now kind of means, well, the requester records, right? You know, a requester makes a request and then it becomes their request. And so in my request, I would say, you know, don't send it to me, put it on YouTube. Um, and so just mass putting video onto YouTube is uh, really not possible with today's policies, procedures, and technology. So here I am today, not as a requester, but as a temporary employee to actually try to figure out how do we change our policies, procedures, and technology um, to really put out as, as much as we possibly can, and not just video, but it's associated records. 
as you kind of heard, um, you know, a storm or request, I think, is kind of understating it. Um, you know, just think of all the requests by attorneys, for example, that want any and all video for a particular case. You know, if you have 10 patrol cars show up at a scene, you know, for an hour, you know, you're talking 20 hours of footage that they've got to go through. And, you know, they're getting 10 requests a day, over 4,000 a year. Um, and it wasn't mentioned uh, earlier, the in-car video policy has changed to actually require more video to be recorded. Um, it used to be a little bit more restrictive, certainly did not require the video to be uh, turned on at the time of dispatch. And um, I would certainly say that this department is very focused now on improving public trust. And uh, the, what we're talking about today kind of falls along this idea of a virtual ride along. If only the, everybody in the public could ride along with the police, could they understand uh, what policing is really like. And um, in my case, I had a much better respect when I could see um, the realities and not just dramatic videos, but you know, the realities. You know, I would, me and other people on LiveWeek.com would watch these two hour uh, DUI cases. In fact, there were people on LiveWeek saying that they're playing video games while watching these two hour long videos about one DUI suspect. So you just get a greater appreciation for what the officers on the street are putting up with and the professionalism that they have. Uh, and I, I can tell you, I think that we in law enforcement would have a much better time with the community if every time something bad happens, we could go and say, yes, this is a mistake, and here's a hundred examples on our YouTube channel of when it goes right, and we will, um, you know, remind officers of, of these good examples. So I would say that the approach that we have taken is just move as fast as you possibly can. And, um, you know, it's all about finding um, some sort of safe category of video that we can work with. Uh, in the case of our uh, body-worn video, uh, the department uh, came up with something kind of unique, which is that officers are to mark which videos um, essentially need to be withheld or require redaction. And so that has allowed us to have a pool that we can work with and not worry so much about the liability if we were to somehow screw up. And um, so that's what we've been doing. We've been trying a lot of different ideas, um, getting feedback, and uh, now there's a uh, full-fledged program in IT to uh, tackle the wide range of issues that have to do with uh, media. Um, for all of our different systems. Uh, and so now we're moving into that operational phase. So I would say uh, we're definitely doing this two-prong approach that uh, Mary talked about. Put as much out there as possible. You know, one thing that we hear about is privacy, right? So under our Records Act, uh, you can request a police report and typically it's going to be unredacted. It's going to have everybody's name and address and whatnot. But when the media requests this stuff from the Public Affairs Unit, that is not operating under the Records Act. And the Public Affairs Division uh, ha uh, made the decision a long time ago that they would redact identifying information. And that's kind of the perfect example where a two-prong approach can really uh, protect uh, privacy. And so if we're able to, you know, put out all the police reports and all the videos and stuff um, and redact it our way, it's going to significantly enhance privacy because there would be less of a need to um, request. I would say the, the biggest thing that the department, I just mentioned flagging, is good data capture. We don't know exactly how many of what percentage of our videos uh, actually require redaction. Um, kind of my rough estimate is it's probably greater than half of it. You know, so if you think 1.6 million dash cameras, you're talking about at least, you know, half a million or more uh, requires no redaction. 
but <coughs> we don't have a reliable data capture system yet in place uh, to know what that half uh, million is. And probably the most challenging aspect is figuring out the status of investigations, right? So that's our primary way to, uh, the primary reason why video is going to be withheld is that stats of the investigation. So I, I'm aware of discussions going on about how can you figure that out quicker. So where are we now? So on uh, data.cl.go, we have a list of the body-worn videos and some of their metadata um, from the first phase. So the, um, the two phases are two different technologies. The first one had, was very easy to get a list. In that um, list, so we, uh, we removed the title columns and the GPS columns uh, entirely um, just because the title columns often have citizens' names we, we just want to protect privacy on our website, so we got rid of that. Uh, it's still requestable. Um, we were able to take about 15 days worth of footage, so back to back, um, and blur it all out uh, in the cloud in three hours. And this could be done in an hour if we had just, so we had one machine. If we had three machines operating at once, we would have gotten that all done in an hour. So that kind of demonstrates, you know, when you're generating, say, 3,000 videos a day, yes, it would be possible every day to, to process that. Most of our CAD RMS events are online. Um, another uh, thing that is being piloted um, you know, with the hiring of me is uh, auto-redacting, auto-over-redacting uh, report narratives. And so we've posted uh, about 2,000 theft reports. Um, and then we also went through and figured out, um, you know, what case numbers tied to body-worn video and redacted those narratives and then just checked to make sure that the computer didn't under-redact them. Something that's uh, related is that our in-car video system has an audit trail system. And uh, me and another uh, uh, requester uh, just loved that data set. Well, you know, it takes months to receive it when you file a records request. Well, the department decided to essentially live stream it. It gets updated every two hours. Uh, it's, it's, it's just incredible what automation can do. It's also an example of auto redaction. Uh, the department uh, doesn't go line by line redacting IP addresses. There's no script that does that. So, you take all this data and you can make it searchable. So, on the left up here, you've got a map. So this is the existing uh, uh, CAD and RMS map that's been around on data.cl.gov for years. You're able to correlate that and just show a map of our body-worn video. On the right is this auto-over-redacted uh, report. And, uh, you know, this is, video is great and all, but I really like these, these reports because we're actually able to redact them fairly precisely today and give people a very detailed idea of what happened in a particular case in an automated fashion. And then below, you've got the ability to search by event number, categories, employees. You can even look up by OPA case that was tied to a video. And then you've got all the videos that are tied to an incident. Um, and then you can play the board out video. And then in an event that a video is uh, flagged by the officer or there's some other indicator that it should uh, not be displayed, we just uh, do that. So like inside of homes or rape uh, victims or whatnot, that sort of video we don't put up online. So we've got a way to know that. While we do have an imperfect system today, right, is what we really want is just to auto-redact very precisely and just put it out. We don't have that today. What we do have is a significant way to help, uh, say, the TV news, for example, quickly get the footage that they want that they'll air. So uh, this past May Day, uh, there was a riot in the evening. We had only three officers, because it's just a pilot program, recording. There was about 300 minutes that they recorded. Um, so one of the outlets, you know, asked us about, you know, hey, are you going to post this online? And, you know, we said, no, it still needs to go for the uh, standard uh, disclosure process. But 
you're definitely welcome to use those videos online to make a more narrow request. So that's exactly what they did. They made a request for just 48 minutes of footage, okay? But remember I said it was only three officers? You know, next year, if we have a full-fledged program, we're talking not 300 minutes, we're talking, you know, 6,000 minutes plus. And that's all footage that's got to be watched from start to finish, make sure, you know, no juveniles or anything exempt is in there. Uh, so this sort of thing is absolutely critical that we have a tool that requesters can use to make, um, you know, say a request for two hours of footage instead of, you know, 50 hours. There are two basic strategies when it comes to what filter you're going to use. The one that we're currently using is blurry. And um, I kind of wanted to look into the possibility of maybe uh, we could uh, provide a preview of uh, footage that we know requires redaction. So the one that I found was the ability to do outlines. And this really takes out a, a tremendous amount of uh, detail. Um, and there are people that do like this. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, maybe this is what you like, or maybe you want to do a hybrid or, or something, you know, where uh, most of your video is bored and some of it's an outline. So, um, I recall this the aha effect, if you remember the 80s aha take on me. I, I told Tim that he had no. He <laughs> So most of the important information is in the audio. And um, uh, have experimented with uh, transcription. Uh, the, the main thing holding us back is, is I can't figure out the, uh, the API for, you know, like Microsoft's got one. I just haven't figured it out yet. But I have been able to show that once you have a transcript, you can auto uh, redact it, either the text uh, like, you, like we've done with the narratives. And then uh, once we've got that, gotten that under our belts, we could look at whether or not we can trust the accuracy numbers that the transcription, automated transcription services give us back. So maybe if we see that, you know, 90% is really accurate or something, particularly in our low-risk videos where they wouldn't have to be redacted under the law, we can start, you know, having the transcription service actually be used to redact the audience. So we've done tests that have shown that, you know, the transcription gives you the start and stop of every single word, and you're able to say, oh, get rid of the proper nouns and plug that into a service that rips it out of the audio. The other thing, too, is uh, transcription certainly has the potential to make it easier for records officers to at least find, uh, say, the conversation with the victim, if not actually be able to click on the words to redact. And I think the concern is this uh, transcription has the most challenging time on the other side <laughs> conversation, like the victim or suspect. It, it certainly has picked up words. Um, but, you know, you risk, uh, risk not seeing it all. So I think there's definitely stuff that we can do with audio. Like I said before, uh, the department has a flagging uh, policy that it's testing. And you can see that uh, very nicely laid out. Um, you know, officers, especially in the pilot, were able to kind of memorize this stuff, you know, like, uh, juveniles. Oh, that's easy. I just talked to a juvenile. I need to find that video. Um, entry into private residence. Some of this we can determine automatically. Like you can you can automatically determine when a call was to say a residence versus a traffic stop or out in the street. Um, so I think flagging is going to be a semi autonomous plus human. And hopefully we can get something that's accurate enough uh, to tell us what requires review and doesn't um, for both publishing online and uh, potentially uh, releasing to records requesters. Just imagine a future where all these requests that you get from your citizens who you have recorded for their own footage could just be emailed to them. And what it ultimately comes down to 
is that previous y, right? So when you've got like a suspect, for example, who is all by himself, got pulled over, arrested for a DUI, the only real thing that needs to be redacted potentially is CGIS NCIC information. And so what the department is talking about now is how to figure out the exact scope of that and, and determine that in an automated fashion. If there's nothing to redact, then you can just give it to them and it's a matter of verifying. So one, one scenario possibly is an officer stops and cites a driver, the officer provides that person a unique code. The next day the driver types the code onto a department website, she downloads all the associated records. The holy grail of redaction, right? So YouTube uh, right now I think uh, is really kind of showing the way. They're the only place where you can go online, take your video and click, press a button that blurs it. And uh, so what we need as a police department <coughs> is something that's absolutely accurate. With the YouTube thing, it, it, you know, if you move your face, it'll, it'll stop blurring. Uh, so we, we need something that's tracking, we need something that blurs not just the face, but the entire head, um, bodies, computer screens, house numbers. Um, so it's just a matter that we have to either create for ourselves or a company needs to make the um, proper uh, recognizers. Uh, Mary had a great idea that you can uh, identify officers uh, potentially by like their badge and unredact them. And then audio automation, so we talked about that a little bit more. We can certainly look into exploring the possibility of um, over-redacting the audio once we have the transcript stuff. And then in terms of a uh, records uh, request, right? So um, there are kind of two possibilities, right? One is that, you know, an officer records a video and then has to put in data. One of the possibilities is you could have a, a recognition service immediately spit back out the officer, hey, here are the faces, can you tell me which one uh, requires redaction? Or you could do it after the fact. So the records officers could um, look at the faces and determine you know, which one is the one that we need to redact. And the main thing here is we just gotta figure out how to take all of those detections that the computer has done and group them, and I've been able to kind of demonstrate that it's possible, just haven't been able to group them into exactly the individual, but certainly have narrowed the number of detections you have to look at. Our next steps is the uh, SPDIT has started the uh, um, Seattle Police Di Digital Media Center program. So this is a large um, program that encompasses a number of projects to um, really make dealing with media in general, not just for public disclosure, but for all the different use cases as efficient as possible. And the work that I, am being, uh, that I have done and continue to uh, do is uh, being looked at it, how to operationalize that, how to put that into that formal program. And then we're developing open source code. So um, our code that we write is available under the Records Act and we're going the nuts stuff to just put it on. GitHub and there's already some code about you know, creating an interface for um, training object detectors. Uh, so this is kind of an example of our rapid prototyping stuff. So trying to come up with ways to improve manual redaction. So one of the big things that I have found is it's hard to go and immediately find the point that I care about. So at the top you see that it's been listed out. And then I can draw a bots around a guy, and then the service goes and tries to trap him. So in a moment here. So there you go, that's, that's him. And you know, it's all about making the interface um, as efficient as possible so you can go and select uh, which one. And then, uh, in terms of our YouTube, where we don't have to worry so much about over redacting, you know, we're allowed to do that on our website. You can combine recognition. So this, there's a lot of false positives, right? So we need to train our own recognizer to work with police videos. But the key thing is, is that at no time were the people in this video ever left unredacted. It's because the recognizer itself has a lot of gaps in it. But by incorporating that tracking that you saw in the manual redaction, you're able to ensure that people are redacted at all times. 
So I think, I think that this technological problem of how to disclose video is really solvable. That's it, Tim? Yeah. You're like Elvis, you left the building, there's no concluding remarks? <laughs> this is why... This is why I love the guy. <clears throat> he, he is like a robot. We put him, Sean and I put him in a corner. It's not even a complete desk, right, Sean? It's about three feet of workspace, gave him a computer, and he churns away at this stuff all day long uh, like a robot. I think Greg's staff is afraid we're going to turn them all into robots. But why don't we do this, because I know everybody's uh, getting a little antsy. Uh, why don't we uh, uh, take a break, just five or ten minutes, let everybody stretch, run to the restroom. We'll come back. Uh, we'll start with Greg, who can give you sort of the global view as well as where we're going to go. And then we'll talk to each of the departments. We'll take questions. I'm sure folks have questions for Tim. And then we'll go around the room and, and talk to the other departments about uh, where they think, where they are and where they're, they're, they think they're going. But uh, before we break, uh, and the chief has to run to another meeting, so chief, I was going to allow you to, any words of wisdom or, as we always say, the benediction before we take a break? No, I think I would just say again, I really appreciate all of you coming because um, as many of us said earlier, we don't claim to have all the answers, that's for sure. Um, but it, when we engage in uh, a forum like this and, and this information exchange, we can all learn from each other. So really appreciate the time everybody took from their schedules uh, to attend. And I just want to say how proud I am of Tim um, and, and how much I appreciate the commitment he's made to this organization. Thank you. Let's take five minutes so we can get back on track. Stretch bathroom and we'll, we'll get back together.